Divine Truth Spirit Experience Experiences of people who have lived on earth and who have now passed into the spirit world. In this recording, titled Spirits Learn About Sins Committed on Earth, to help participants in the upcoming Understanding Sin and Its Causes Assistance Group, Mary channels Marjorie, who is the speaker for a group of male and female spirits who came at Jesus' request to talk about what they have learned about sin after they passed into the spirit world. Recorded on the 4th of February 2019 from 1pm in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Session 1 Well, hi everyone. I'm here in the studio today with Jesus. Hey, darling, how are you? I'm <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> We've had a slow start today, but um, we would like to do some channeling with a group of spirits. We're about to go into our assistance group about sin and its causes. And so Jesus was talking, mentioning this morning that maybe some spirits would like to come and speak about sin. And... Um, there was a lot of excitement about that and a large group of spirits have gathered to, to speak about their experiences with sin. And um, I've already been speaking to a couple of the spirits who are part of that group. Uh, there's a lady called Helen and another one called Marjorie and I think Marjorie will be the spokesperson. But they've told me that they, they feel a little self-conscious about coming because they feel they had very ordinary lives on earth uh, but it's for that reason that they have been chosen that mm. their lives matched a lot of the experiences that many people have on earth and I'm sure they'll explain it much more <laughs> when they start their discussion with Jesus but yeah. that's what we're planning to talk to them about today. Good eh? So Mary will just uh, take her time getting uh, settled and and then I'll have a, have a chat with Marjorie and obviously, what was the other? Oh, Helen just popped in just Marjorie now. Marjorie and Helen. But <laughs> so I think... Uh, it'll be mostly Marjorie yeah, is our, our spokesperson. Yeah. So we'll speak to Marjorie in a minute. Hello. G'day, Marjorie. Yeah. How are you? Thanks for being patient. <laughs> Had to do all of our sound tests ready for the group. <laughs> that was no problem. I'm excited to to come and speak with you. It's uh, it's quite an honour. It feels and quite an unexpected honour. <laughs> <laughs> I should say that there's a large number of us here, both men and women. Over fifty thousand, in fact. We were. It seems as though we were called all together all at once because perhaps there were things that we could share but also to learn through our discussion with you. Mm. So, mm. Thank you for having us all. And yeah, well, thanks for coming along. I think, I think one of the reasons why I'd like to have this discussion is that a lot of people on earth uh, live what they classify to be sort of like a relatively normal life and, uh, and then when they pass into the spirit world, they are quite surprised, aren't they, about some things regarding the the way in which uh, their life pans out in the spirit world. They're particularly surprised about the sin that's engaged uh, and God's view of sin versus you know the world's view of sin. So on the on the world, the view of sin seems to be pretty relaxed. <laughs> you could say, to put it mildly, if anybody believes in sin at all. Um, but obviously God's laws have a very uh, clear and definite uh, viewpoint of sp specific courses of actions. And so what we'd like to do with you today is discuss with you some of these things that you sort of viewed as pretty normal on earth, that were, you know, part of your normal life on earth. But once you've passed, it, it seemed like these were things that you had to work your way through with regard to sins and, and how God's laws felt about those particular problems that you faced when you didn't view them as problems on earth if we could say that yes and specifically we'd like to talk to you about two main issues sure one that most of us us females have found to be quite challenging because we believed contrary to even considering that these attitudes and ideas were sinful we actually thought they made us good women 
and equally for the men who are gathered here, they shared some very similar ideas about what they thought made them a very good man on earth, only to find when coming here that they that we all had a lot to learn and to understand that what we thought was good was actually sin. Yeah, not as good as what, <laughs> not very loving in many cases. That's right. And, and really a lot of our definitions of love were sinful without us understanding. And I should say that we only just commenced our um, work in the third sphere. So it has taken us this long really to deal with many of those injuries, you would call them, that we had on earth surrounding what is sin and what is love and uh, to reach a place now where we feel we have some perspective on mm. what it was we we thought was right well, that was actually wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perhaps I could ask a few questions first, if that's okay with you. Yes. Did all of you, when you arrived in the spirit world, arrive in pretty much the same place? Yes, very similar. Okay. And what was that place? And now that you're in the third sphere, you could look back at your first sphere life. Was it sort of like in the middle of the third sphere or in the upper levels of the third sphere, uh, first sphere, sorry, or, or not in, in the hells of the first sphere? I, I wouldn't say we were in the hells. I have visited some places that, uh, yes, are definitely hellish, I would call them. I would say... Um, Perhaps in the top third of the first sphere, we weren't in extreme agony or extreme darkness, if that helps to explain, but neither were we in a place of great brightness. It was a dusky sort of a situation, and many of us felt rather confused about why we were where we were, and rather um lost i suppose aimless uh unable to find anyone or anything to do or to to um yes it wasn't a good feeling but neither was it torturous and did many of you stay earthbound for a while before you arrived in that place or did you all arrive there fairly quickly uh it varies a little my exit from the earth plane, well, no, I would say I was earthbound for a short time while my family was grieving intensely, but perhaps a year, uh, and then I moved on. I knew I, I had cancer, so I knew I was passing for a year. Even though I was quite young when I passed, mm -hmm. I, um, I did have some anticipation Others here amongst the men who died of heart, sudden heart attacks found it a lot harder <laughs> to leave the earth plane. But I wouldn't say we have seen other spirits who are much more um, well bound is a good word, much more um, compulsive in their engagement in the earth. Whereas for many of us, a lot of our injured perspectives centered around family. And so uh, connection to the family was the hardest thing for all of us to, to break away from. And so our time in the earth space, it varied from one to five and some of, some of us up to eight years. Yes. And so when you arrived in, your, in the first sphere state and you're in that sort of dusky place where it's it's not light and it's not dark, and, uh, but, but you can see what's going on around you. It, it, it would be best to describe it as not very colourful. Uh, That's right. Yes, and in that place you were in a state, you said, of relative confusion as to why you arrived there. Yes. Were, did you know that you were in the spirit world by that stage? It's a good question. I think that awareness grows here, doesn't it? And so for myself, I was, I was aware on some level that I had passed, I suppose. 
but I hadn't yet let the full recognition of my passing to to hit me, if that makes sense. I, I didn't think much about it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So you were more driven by how you felt than how you thought? Yes, yes. And, and, and was I, that the same for each of you, or were some of you highly intellectual and still trying to work <laughs> out why it is you were where you were? Yes, certainly there was a number of the men who felt... Um, almost as if they used their minds to try and get out of the puzzle of where they were. They knew that they had passed after a, a relatively short amount of time. They understood they were in a new place. Um, and then they tried to navigate out of it, <laughs> <laughs> which to no avail, obviously. Yes. We found each other, some of us. Um, we found uh, almost companionship in, in each other because many of us were in a similar state and obviously in the same physical location. Um, But I would say predominantly for the females, we were less intellectual about where we were, although this slow dawning occurred that this was the new life, if, if I could put it that way, certainly for myself. And I knew that the, that I no longer lived on earth, but the, the understanding of this new environment and that this was, in fact, a spirit life, it took me some time to have conscious thoughts about that. Did, it, did many of you have sort of what you would classify as clear beliefs about the spirit life when you were on Earth? No, no, no. No, and I would say that I had a very... I don't think I was very introspective on earth. I lived the life that I thought was right. And I attended church myself personally. Not everyone here did that. Um, But I, I had a very, on reflection, what was a rudimentary sense of God and right and wrong. I, I followed the dictates of my society very, uh, very much. And I had never really considered very much what would happen when I pass, except to to go and be with God and Jesus, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but when, and, but after you passed, you didn't really think about that, did you? No, no, no. I I felt oh, oh well. On reflection, now I can see that I was quite lost in. Well, perhaps lost in my sin. <laughs> I it was clouding, just as it was like that time between um, day and night, this dusky, dusky surroundings. So too was my thought processes, I suppose, and my my feeling sense. Even I was very much um, not very alive. I suppose is mm. the right thing to say. Yeah, it's probably a good way of saying it, isn't it? Mm. We often don't realise that we're not really living very much when we're on Earth. (laughs) And when we pass, we come to realise that in time. Mm. Mm. That was quite shocking for me to understand that the state that I found myself in, in this sort of top of the lower third of the first sphere and the surroundings and my feeling senses, when I, I finally came to understand that this was how... I had been living in my life on earth, that was quite shocking. And you would have had some grief probably about choices you made on earth compared to what you could have done perhaps. Yes, a great deal of grief. And is that the same for all of you? You you come to some point of recognising that your life on earth was sort of half lived? Yes, yes. Because, interestingly, we were driven by some very core definitions of what we felt it was to be good. And perhaps Mm. that's why we've been chosen to come here because we did live a life where we thought about trying to do good and to be loving and especially to love our families. And yet um, we've come to learn that we really did not understand what that means. Yes. All right. Well, that's a good bit of background. So, so now you, but you're all in the third sphere of the spirit world, I gather. Yes, just 
we've just entered. Yes, so you would be happy with that. Yes, very. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a lot more pleasant than that uh, lower two thirds of the first sphere, isn't it? Yes. Mm. So now that you come to this location and uh, getting to the subject of our discussion, which is all about really recognizing, you could you could say the theme of our discussion is. It's like recognising sin or how difficult it is to recognise sin. Mm. It's probably a better way of saying it. So perhaps you, you said earlier in your introduction that you, there, were, there, were, there were women who had specific problems relating to family and the men had other specific problems relating to family, I gather, as well. Yeah. So, so let's look uh, firstly, if we can start with the girls and, and their particular feelings about family mm. and what you've since learnt is a sin regarding those particular beliefs. Sure. Yes, if we speak about the females, and it does seem somewhat strange, in fact, I feel quite embarrassed about how much of a stereotypical housewife I was. <laughs> <laughs> but um, nonetheless, that was my life. Yes. Um, but... All of us uh, struggled to come to understand when we arrived here that our desire to sacrifice our own self, our own wants, and our own uh, physical needs in many cases uh, for the sake of loving our family, what we believe to be loving our family, how much of a sin that was. Mm. Can we start with uh, what you felt a stereotypical housewife was <laughs> and then we can work our way from there? Certainly. And um, I in no means mean to be insulting to housewives. No, not at all. Uh, but there is a general view on earth, isn't there, of what makes a good woman when it comes to the family and looking right. after and caring for her family. And, and perhaps what we need to do is sort of look at some of those beliefs and then look at what you've learnt about those particular beliefs. Yes, because this is something also that I find very interesting. When I look at my descendants on earth today, many of those women, uh, my daughters for example, and now granddaughters, they do not have the same lifestyle that I had, but many of them have the same injury mm. and that's why I would like to talk about it. Uh, as, as do many, many women on the earth. Yes. So I was a housewife in the 1950s, in perhaps the heyday of housewives. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that's probably true too. <laughs> and so I, I married my sweetheart quite young, mm -hmm. and we lived in a city that wasn't huge, but neither was it a town, and we lived in the suburbs, and in what country was this? I was in Australia. It was in Perth, actually. Right. And Perth in those days was much smaller than it is today. And uh, so I spent my... Uh, I wanted to have a family, and so we started a family. And I spent my days caring for the physical environment of our home and also for the children and for my husband when he returned from his work. And I occupied myself in these ways and I didn't think very much about what would fulfill me as a person. And in fact, there were many times where I felt it was correct for me to sacrifice what I wanted in favour of what I believed at the time that my children needed or my husband needed. And this was quite a global issue from my physical needs, as I mentioned, uh, my sexual desires, also my, um, my interests and my friendships and everything I believed in order to be a good woman, I must make all of those things subservient to the needs of my children, especially my children, but also my husband. I was taught in the church, in fact, that sacrifice was a very loving thing. And I believed that the joy then that I received through my children, if I could say that, uh, was my reward 
for that sacrifice. I suppose there's many things I could also share about my story uh, to to demonstrate a little. Um, I actually lost a son in a boating accident when he was 15, six, going on 16. And that was very traumatic for me <laughs> because I realise now that I was trying to live my life through my children quite mm. a lot. Uh, and then I became ill with cancer in my late 50s and I passed in my, well, I was 61. And so um, there are many things we could discuss about that, but I can see that many of my attractions on earth were attempting to show me that perhaps my sacrifice wasn't as loving as I thought it was. Yeah. Not everyone has such a dramatic story as myself. No, but a lot of times a life like that is on earth sort of relatively considered as normal where yes. you, you sacrifice for your children and the husband, you know, you still might do certain, some of you may have worked and some of you may not have, but still there is this underlying feeling of sacrifice for your family. And as you said, in the physical sense, sexual sense and emotional sense, in terms of sacrificing what you desire. Yes. And that's a fairly common thing, isn't it, in yes. families, and particularly for women in families. And then also, um, I suppose you could say the reason for the cancer, which is the underlying desire that other people give you the approval and acceptance that you were desiring through the sacrifice you were making. Um, yeah. Sort of like earning their approval and acceptance through the actions you were taking. Yes. Mm. And I... I have experienced a great deal of grief about not only the um, the feeling of just how sad and unhappy I was underneath that um, demand to have others love me mm. because I was not loving myself. Yeah. And it, I've found on earth too it's tempting, isn't it, to try to get somebody to love you because... You feel it's harder to love yourself almost. And so, you know, oftentimes you're seeking for love from other sources rather than just going, well, no, the problem is that I don't love myself and I need to work on that particular problem. Yeah. Yes, and I feel that um, through their own life experience, my mother and my sister and many of my female relatives and friends all shared the same concept of what a good woman was mm. and the idea that one must compromise oneself on many levels um, in order to make a happy home, that yeah. this ideal of a happy home was not possible if a woman fully uh, expressed herself and her desires. Mm. So I suppose now we come to the, that's the life. Now, now we come to, well, well, for most people listening on earth, they go, well, that's a fairly normal sort of life you your you know, interest in your family, of course, you know, and doing all these things for your family mostly uh, and for your friends mostly. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a pretty normal life, you know. And then on top of that, you know, sickness comes along of some kind, which is pretty normal on the earth today, you know, yes. where people get sick and, and sometimes we even die from our sicknesses. So that all sounds pretty normal sort of a life on earth. Yes, <laughs> as I said. <laughs> And, so, and I seemed very normal in my society, if, if that makes sense. I, I didn't stand out in any way, or yeah. I didn't think so. So you fitted in, I suppose mm -hmm. you could say, with society generally. My lifestyle was typical of those around me, yes. I would say. Yes. Okay, so, so then the question becomes, well, how, how is any of that a sin? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I thought when I arrived here and I began to finally have some assistance. It was very difficult for the people who were assisting me to try to help me to understand how on earth any of that was a sin. Mm. And so what have you discovered in the process? Well, as I said, I feel I'm still in the process of discovering my full potential and the full potential of love. But I did discover that... Uh, My desire, firstly, my desire to, to have a sacrificial life with it sounds a little dramatic, but, it, you know, to sacrifice so much of myself was driven a lot by uh, 
my fear of being seen to be a bad woman. So not even based on a misguided definition of love, but really based upon social and familial pressure for me to live in that way. And I've also learned that it is possible that everyone in any group may be happy with nobody sacrificing themselves. And that would have been possible for my family, although difficult because of the multi-generational pressures and injuries that each person in my family, in my immediate family, my husband and children, had inherited. Yes. And uh, so the changes that I have made here in the spirit life, however, I could have made on earth. So and there's a sadness about that still. So you passed when you were early 60s, so yes. 61. And, and what year around about was that on earth? In the eight, 1983, I think, yep. yes. In the process since, you would have seen your children, particularly your daughters, grow? Yes. And um, what have you noticed them doing? Uh, well, they are much more career-minded, I suppose, or to my mind back then would have been, I would have called them career-minded. One of them... Um, works still in an office and has had her own family and I see that she tries to still have this uh she puts herself last I would I would say she puts herself last in terms of her family and her work she she uh works hard at both things probably through my example but she rarely spends the time upon herself or on her desires, uh, believing that that would be um, selfish or un unrealistic with her partner and her children. She is yet to see, as I have seen, that she does this, that there is an anger brewing in her about these things. Yes, yes. Um, that she actually does feel very unloved and is not allowing herself to be aware of that because she she is struggling under a lot of false concepts and therefore doesn't reason very logically about the fact that other things are possible. Yeah. So if you examine your sort of life, I suppose you could say there's a big thing highlighted in your life that you wanted to talk about today about and relationship to sin. Mm. So the big thing is, in summary, can we say? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that sacrifice is not a part of love and that when we sacrifice ourselves, we do sin. This is a sin. And perhaps I should explain a little bit more about what I mean there because um, what I have learned now is that when one loves another person, they want to give. They do want to give to that person. And many times they're happy to forgo certain things for themselves in order to give to, to the other person. But the motivation is love <laughs> it doesn't come from a sense of um duty and it doesn't come from a sense of fear of how one will be seen if one doesn't give and it was difficult for me to come to terms with the fact that many times i gave what i call gave to those around me but i did it not from a truly loving sense but out of a sense of duty or out of a sense of fear of how I would be judged if I didn't do that. So that when you say judge, judge by society generally or society. judge by members of your family or friends? Everyone. Mm. Um, I Again, I didn't think very... I, I wasn't even aware that I was doing that. I, I believed I was loving. Did you even have enough time for self-reflection? No. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Yeah. Um, and many people create lives on earth where they don't even have the time for self-reflection. That's right. And any time that we had as a family was either spent um, 
I suppose, working towards um, improving our home or lifestyle uh, or we felt we had to give the children pleasure and so mm. taking them to the beach or taking them somewhere uh, or eating or drinking, really. Yeah, yeah. And that's pretty normal, isn't it? Even in society today, I would suggest. Yes. And so this, this idea that, um, firstly, that self-sacrifice is loving, I came to see that um, to give a gift is loving and through giving a gift, one may sacrifice something that one um, might have had otherwise, but it's, that gift giving is not done through a sense of duty and neither is it done through a, a fear of what would happen if the gift wasn't given or given with the expectation that at some point I would be loved in the same way in return or that that person would sacrifice something for me in return. And I saw and I still see many families based around, almost bound together through the idea that if I sacrifice for you now, then you should sacrifice for me later and so on and so forth. Yes. And that is very damaging to everyone involved in those dynamics and is a great creator of sin. It, it is sin and creates many more sins that travel through generations. So probably in summary then we could say there were three primary issues that you could see involved in this sin, mm-hmm. if you like. And see, because most, when you use the word self-sacrifice, most people on earth, when they hear that, they probably don't even think what they're doing is self-sacrifice, do they? <laughs> no, that's right. Mm. They believe, as I believe, that they are just being a good moral person. That's right, yeah. But, but as soon as we give out of duty, mm-hmm. so that was the one issue that you raised, Yes. if we give out of fear of how we will be perceived if we don't give, Yes. Or vice versa, not giving because we're afraid that if we do give, something will happen negatively as well. Yes. So there's the fear associated with giving or not giving. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing you mentioned was that issue of... um, The desire to be given to in return. Yes, the want of of some... It's like a bargaining involved in the giving. Yes. Uh, you could call it a, a, a bartering system with regard to giving. Yes. Yes. Yes, so I've learned that in that way I sinned greatly. I, my, my sacrifice of self not only damaged myself and my own happiness and well-being, but it damaged the people around me. And many times I see many people, not just women, but many people have these injuries, but they believe that through doing it, if they have any awareness at all, they believe it is merely harming themselves. But what I've come to see now is the great deal of harm that I did to my family through those actions, because I taught them a lot of detrimental things about, in in our family's case, about the role of women, what creates a good woman, I created a sense of entitlement to receive in my children and in my husband. Um, And there's many, many other things that flow on from this idea that if I give up myself for some kind of external reward, then um, that's being a good person. So there's the issue of how you can see why it's a sin, because there's the issue of how it wasn't loving to yourself, mm-hmm. firstly, because you, you were obviously making sacrifices that actually caused a build-up of anger inside of you over time, yes. which, which eventually obviously needed to be released at some mm-hmm. point, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. But then also there's the other aspect that you raised, which was the fact that you teach other people that they can do things or get away with things that are unloving too. Yes. And so in the pro- process of that, by allowing... Uh, them to get away with these unloving things you're basically in teaching them and particularly with your children yes. you know with your husband he would have already have some set set motivations for that but with the children in particular you're teaching a brand new soul all these things which they then grow up and live out in their life don't they yes mm. i really taught them to love a, a sacrificial a person who sacrifices their own desires and wants and so they 
believe that that's how they be good. That's what I see in my daughter. And they also seek that out in someone to love. And they see if someone does that, that that person is loving them. And I see the great deal of unhappiness that occurs in relationships over time because each party holds on to the exact same injury. Yeah. But then, of course, there's also things that I taught my sons. I had two sons and a daughter that where they came to view women as having more obligation to sacrifice themselves than yes. men. Which meant that they would then be demanding with whatever partners they might have in the future. Yes, and look for a, a good wife and mother for their children. Look for someone who sacrificed themselves in those roles. Yes, and, and is that how the, their life has panned out for those for the for the boys? Well, one of my sons has passed, passed. and uh, I visit with him in the spirit world now. Yeah. But um, yes, my other son, yes. But again, I would like to point out that uh, sometimes when we speak about these things, uh, the imagination may imagine a, a terrible, terrible. Uh, abusive man who sits in front of the TV and barks orders at his wife. Yes. And, and <laughs> that's not uh, how he lives. But the, the general atmosphere and the flavour or the, the attitudes within the relationship simply reinforce the, the, um, the goodliness, I suppose, in a female to sacrifice herself for the sake of children and her family life. And in him, he reflects, um, so he sees that as good in his wife. And she sees uh, in him some of the, the injury that is common in men that we wish to speak to you about, his desire to go out into the world and have worldly achievements as a very good and loving thing for his family. And so they, to all um, intents and purposes, may, may seem to have a very happy marriage. It is only that I see that over time the resentments grow because I've learned also that if one doesn't have a loving attitude to oneself or to others, then over time... <laughs> Unhappiness grows, and if we don't feel that unhappiness, resentment grows uh, in relationships. And yeah. so that's playing out. Um, but we speak about these things today because they are so entrenched and typical on the earth that nobody notices. Only in extreme examples do people notice Notice. that there's a problem. That's right, yeah. And the guy who sits in the front of the telly barking orders, they might notice that. Yeah. In yes. terms of a normal lifestyle, most people would think it's a good thing. Uh, the wife would think her husband's a good husband and the wife, husband would think his wife's a good wife. And as you said, they could be relatively or uh, feel they're quite happy together. Yes. Yeah. Could I just mention one more thing sure. about that? What I notice ends up pervading uh, many relationships and many, many relationships that have these undercurrents or these attitudes. They're not really undercurrents, but these... Yeah. these strong um, interblending of the emotional injuries, is what I notice is that many times they each will maintain that they have quite a happy relationship. But what comes to happen over time is not only is there small resentments growing between the two, which build and build and build, but also there is a pervading sense of just disillusionment with life. Because they think I'm doing all the right things and yet I'm not really fulfilled and I'm not really happy, but I can't find why that is. And I suppose that's how I arrived in the spirit life where I felt very unfulfilled, but I just had no real understanding of why. I didn't feel indignant or upset. I just couldn't understand why things were like this. And if somebody had told you right at the time of passing or, or shortly after, you probably would have argued with them about yeah. the fact. <laughs> I would have defended my actions yeah. as being the best things that I had done on earth. The things that were spoken about at my funeral, the things that <laughs> I felt I could be proud of, yeah. were some of the areas where I held the most sin in my life. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't yeah. it? 
Now, you mentioned three areas. You said you sacrificed physically. Mm -hmm. In other words, we, if we use the word in place of the word sacrifice, you did things dutifully. Yes. Or you did things with regard to wanting some kind of return. Mm -hmm. Or you did things for what was the third one the again? Fear. The, the fear. fear. That's right. The fear of how you would be perceived. How, how did you do those? What physical things did you do there? Well, for example, um, it seems trivial that when I had small children that I was nursing and I had been up all night uh, and there was a small break and they were napping, rather than just taking a nap myself, sometimes I would do cleaning in the house yeah. or I, yeah. would, I would care very much about Oh, making sure everything ran smoothly and that there was no hiccups for anyone else when my children were involved in sports and so on. I did a lot of things to make sure all of their clothing and equipment was ready and I stayed up late at night um, sewing a costume for my daughter and yeah. many things that I see now I could have involved them in more but I paid a physical price in terms of my rest or my I couldn't be engaged in other things, even just simple conversations with my husband because I was so focused on meeting their physical needs. So, like, you see that a lot, don't you, on earth with sports, for example, when children are involved in sports or music or art or something during those formative years. The parents do pretty much everything that the child doesn't want to do about that particular thing instead of the child seeing that... that that the like the sport if you're going to go out and play you're going to get your clothes dirty and someone's going to have to wash them yes. and it's going to have to be you instead of yes. instead of them <laughs> thinking that they go no mummy will do that for me you yes. know or someone else will do that for me and and this is where we teach them a, ver a lot of very bad habits isn't it yes and and i've come to see as well that um not only is that the case i could have helped them be to become far more independent and i speak <laughs> my sons had more onus on them than, than uh, I, I, sus I suppose, I mean, I, there was more onus on my daughter to assist me than mm. there was on my son. Because of the role, gender role. Yes. Mm. However, for all of them, I could have assisted them to grow more independence and more understanding and responsibility. Um, yeah. Yeah. But also I've come to see the way that Roger and my husband and myself, how, how invested we were in our children doing certain things um, because we felt it would be good for them and good for their development and yeah. we felt sports was a healthy thing for children to be into, to help them to learn rules and yes. teamwork and fair play. And it meant and, you were a good parent when you <laughs> did all that. <laughs> well, we, we were so invested in them learning those lessons yes. that even when they were half-hearted about it, we filled in many of those gaps that you mentioned, many of yes. the things that they didn't want to do because we so much wanted them to learn those things. Yes. Of course, not seeing how... They didn't really want to in the first place. <laughs> yes, but also how, how many um, other detrimental things we taught them. Of course. Through yeah. the pro some, sometimes they did learn some things about getting along with others and teamwork <laughs> but we also taught them many other things about that, um, mum, that women will sacrifice yes. for you <laughs> and those kind of things yes and parents should sacrifice for their children yes. and so forth yeah yeah you can see how we on one hand we're trying to do one thing thinking it's good uh, while at the same time sacrificing a whole lot of other moral issues <laughs> yes without any you know, concern for those moral issues yes mm. You also mentioned the sacrifice of sexuality. What, what did you mean when you said that? Well, many times I had sex with my husband when I didn't want to. And you felt it was a duty or a, something that yes. a good woman did? Yes, I felt it was something that um, was good for him and, <laughs> and was, uh, yes, it was something that a good woman did. I struggled, as many women of my generation struggled, to feel that sex should be something that was fulfilling for me. Yep. And so, and I felt that any kind of overt sexual expression was in fact un 
sinful. <laughs> well, in, um, in other words, if we put it more bluntly, that it, that a, a wife doesn't do those things, it's more like what a prostitute would do. <laughs> yes, I suppose. I suppose again, I did not think about any of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I understood that Roger was happier when we when we made love. Um, he was very affectionate. And I felt very f fond and close to him during our sexual times. It wasn't, but there were times where I felt physically exhausted or emotionally depleted. And I suppose in those times I gave my physical body yeah. without giving anything of myself because I felt I was just simply so exhausted. And did he notice that? That is a good question, and one perhaps I should speak to him about some more, uh, because at the time I would have said no, and that was another thing that I realised I was accruing sadness about. But upon reflection, I feel he, he could sense that, but he didn't know how to reach me or why it was like that. Or did he care enough to find out? It's so difficult, isn't it, to... I suppose in one sense he didn't care enough, but neither did I care enough to communicate or to be transparent with him about what was happening for mm. me. Uh, and so, yes, he could have been more sensitive. I feel there were times when he was sensitive to my exhaustion, perhaps. Mm. But no, I, I feel he still had many um, ideas about what a loving wife did yeah. and uh, what a, a good husband was entitled to. And so we had sex many times based on that, both of us sharing that same belief. Yes. I believed he was entitled to this um, if I was a good wife. He also believed that. And mm. so sex happened many times under those circumstances. But I see now how uh, there was a sadness in him about our sexual life. I see that, but I don't think he saw that at the time and I don't think he could have understood really what it was about mm. because it's, it's so difficult to express how much we were locked into these ideas mm. without any introspection. Yes, no, that's, but it's common, very common, isn't very it? Very common. Yeah. And, and while I see on Earth today, because I do visit and watch with some interest, I see there is some, some small level of discussion or introspection beginning in certain people about these matters that we're speaking about, not just about sexuality, but mm. about everything we're speaking about. Even though that has begun, what I see in the hearts of people is not a lot of change. Mm. There are different faces and there's different expressions, but there's still a lot of ideas about um, what makes a good wife and what makes a good husband. And people rarely question those things. And what makes a good parent too, obviously. Yes, those, yes, those obviously. Things. What what, it would, what a good family is. Yeah, yes. yeah. And the third thing was the sacrifice of your desires. Yes. So maybe you could give some examples of that. Well, I really didn't stop to think about what interested me. At no point in my life, perhaps as my children got a little older and there was other things happening socially uh, around me, um, I began to, to think a little about what would interest me, but really that heartfelt connection to curiosity and uh, passion was never a part of my life after childhood. I felt that um, there were certain things that I enjoyed as I got older, but many of them were still within the dictates of what I believed a good woman was uh, in my society. And so I did some crafty things and I did some social things and I held 
baby showers and, and different things for different people. And I enjoyed those things. I did them out of some sense of desire, not just duty. But I, I realise now there is so much that really I could be interested in anything. And so many things were never considered by me because I really allowed my desire to only remain in the dictates of what was typical for a woman of my society and my my position in society. Uh, and so that we're... aside from all the other desires when, as my children were growing, when I would have liked to eat baked beans on toast, but I made <laughs> sausages and mashed potato and, and yeah. things like that, yeah. uh, the, yeah. the, the, the minor things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So be correct to say probably when it comes to desires that firstly there was the issue of keeping your desires in to, to fit within the societal norm. Yes. Yes. So that, that's one issue. But then there's also this other issue, isn't it, of like looking at like the universe is so, um, there, there are so many subjects available yes. for study and investigation, isn't there, in the universe. Yes. But, but what I notice is most people while they're on earth barely touch or even even look at any of those particular things nothing and and i feel now the the vast expansiveness of what is on offer and yet what i see in my life in earth, on earth and then in the life of people still on earth is that they are mainly caught up in in trying to fulfill these roles that they believe they should fulfill in society um and much of that is sin I've mm. come to see. So my, most of my um, family life was driven by a lot of um, misunderstandings of love, a lack of love of self and, and, as we discussed, of others. But all of it I felt was very important that I must do it and it was a good life to do it. And I never really considered how else I could live my life or, as you say, the fascinating things that exist everywhere around me. I, I felt there was no time for any of that. Yes, and this is the trouble, isn't it, of investing all of your sort of energy and time and effort into family mm. when it should be just a little aspect of your life because mm. it can still be an aspect of experience that is enjoyable. But... Instead of uh, doing that, what we tend to do is invest everything into it to the sacrifice uh, of everything else. Yes. In terms of, and then when we pass in the spirit world, because the family is far less defined there, isn't it? Yes. And then eventually, of course, uh, everybody, you know, basically everyone sort of stands alone at some point mm -hmm. in their future. Um, then it's like you're at sea and you don't know what to do because the very thing that consumed your life on earth... Yeah. Just like a man who might be a lawyer on earth and that consumes him. So to uh, a woman who's consumed by family when she's on earth, she passes in the spirit world only to realise in the end that the cons this feeling of being consumed by it is the actual error itself and has caused many problems for herself and others, but also caused her to not desire all this wondrous universe that is available to us in understanding that, you know. Yes. And uh, my desires now to give love and to, to even, I see that there is a place for a desire to give love to children and mm. to educate children and to, to create a family with, with a partner and that many of those desires may be based on love. And I don't feel that my attraction to Roger when we first met was uh, completely baseless in terms of love. It's only that these social dictates that we, and I call it social dictates, but perhaps there's a better word, these sinful beliefs that we had about what was a good life mm. and what could be expected for life and what, um, how we must behave in our life really limited our, not only our relationship, but the potentials for our children and for our whole 
life on earth. Yeah, so in our assistance group coming up, we're going to talk about how morality, values and faith determine uh, what we do, you know. Mm. And you could say your values were firmly set, family is everything, yes. even at the sacrifice of self. Your morality was set to be family is everything at the value yeah. <laughs> sacrifice of self. And your faith is if I do that, people will love me and care about me and I'll be honoured and And I'll and be respected. happy. And you'll I be happy, believed yeah. I would be happy, yes. And each of those things were flawed in, yes. in this case. So, yes. And you can see that's why in the end you don't end up very happy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's good. All right, well, thank you for sharing that experience, Marjorie. Um, now, should we go on to the men issue, yes, perhaps? Yes, yeah. let's. And we'll see how I go. Perhaps a man <laughs> will step forward who wants to speak about it. Probably what we need to do if, if, if you don't speak, if, they don't, if they're not happy with how you're expressing it, <laughs> should we say, <laughs> yes, they, they can, can step definitely. forward and express it more clearly, perhaps. That sounds simple. Okay. So in a similar way to what we've done with yourself, Marjorie, we'd like to talk about the man issue, what the men in your group have had the issue, have, have had to face in terms of feeling that they were doing a good thing, but only to find out that actually from God's perspective, it's a sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the men's experience, the, those who were gathered here, they lived lives on earth where they were very interested in um, being good providers for their families in terms of financially, but they also sought uh, positions of status and that or they sought to, to excel or have great achievement in their profession or their employment, uh, but mainly based upon the desire to be seen as a good man and to gain the respect of others. So that is the major issue that they wish to clarify with you, I suppose. This, yes. this idea that I'm a good man if I seek out uh, wealth and worldly achievements and provide wealth for my family. I need to be a man who can be looked up to in my community and by my family and I need to provide physical wealth for my family or physical means for my family, even if that is at the expense of time with my family, love for my family, or, or, or they would say, this is loving your family to do this. Yes. Uh, and also at the expense of certain other ethics and morality. Uh, it's, it's all justified if a father is a good protector and provider for his wife and children. So uh, for many of the men, what did they choose to do with that particular drive or desire? So they were very, <laughs> well, th some of them are saying, I was a workaholic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I worked so, very hard. So we should define a workaholic, someone yeah. that just can't stop working. <laughs> That's right. And who works uh, really most of their time <laughs> yeah. and works somewhat to escape everything else. They, they feel driven towards working uh, so as to get this feeling and they end up spending most of their time working. Yes, to, to get the feeling of being a, a worthy provider and a worthy man. Uh, others of them sought uh, promotions and um, to rise in their company or, in their, or to start their own business and to have a great deal of um, recognition for, for their ability to, to give to others. Again, this, this idea of giving, but was really more about the image of giving. Um, and also to be quite um, proficient in a certain thing and to make sure others knew that. And also to some of them are saying they wanted to be someone that their wife and children could look up to. And so they placed a lot of pressure on themselves to be, uh, to almost some of them to sacrifice themselves in terms of working. Some worked physically 
working very, very hard or working very, very long hours so as to be seen as a good provider and someone who really loved his family by mm. doing those things. And then, of course, uh, just like the wives, when they come home from work, they're all exhausted and tired, but the kids have certain demands that the parents have created. <laughs> yes, yes. And so oftentimes the weekends are spent doing this for this child and doing that for this child and so yes. forth. Yes. In order to have the same feeling, really, isn't it? To be perceived as a good good man and good provider and good, good husband and so forth. Yes. Although there's, there is a large uh, number here who feel quite a bit of sadness that they didn't even pause in their work focus to spend time with their children to mm. even take them places and do things with them. So yeah. there's a very strong flavour amongst this group of really um, a worldly focus and a deep desire for financial security uh, so that he could allay the fear <laughs> of his wife and children uh, so that everyone could feel steady and stable. But often he did this um, so that he could feel like he's a good man. Yeah, so often the motivations were really quite selfish in mm. some regards. Yes, at, at their core, but again, mm. similar to myself, the men found it very challenging to really understand how that could be so. Yeah. Each man feels like he's being a good man if, if those around him feel safe and satisfied and, those, and uh, people around him have a good opinion of him. He feels, well, I must be doing the right thing. And if it were to be different, then he would have felt, I'm, I'm failing. I'm failing at my life. There's yeah. a strong sense of the need to avoid failing as a man. And what was the result of a lot of that, uh, that sort of action for many of the men that are in, in, your, in your group? Well, many of them felt a certain sense of emptiness, uh, which, wasn't, which only really became apparent to many of them when they entered. They entered into a similar state as I did mm -hmm. in the spirit world, into this sort of empty, dusky existence. Uh, where they realised there wasn't much substance to their life apart from their work. Um, a lot of them also grew a sense of resentment towards their family and a sense of uh, demand upon their family members to give to them because they were giving so much. Uh, they were sacrificing themselves, I suppose, in a way so much for the sake of the family. Some of them felt very um, driven in their relationship with their father and trying to prove themselves to their father, to prove they could be a better father than their own father was to them and their mother. Uh, or conversely, feeling they needed to measure up to the wonderful example their father had been of this very... Uh, problematic uh, lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did they come to recognise the sin in all of that? I'm just uh, gathering information here. For some of them it, it was quite difficult because they, did res they were so engrossed in their earthly endeavours. They felt very uh, single-minded in many cases about the idea that if they had worldly success in terms of recognition or financial security, then they must, be, they must have been doing the right thing. And many of them found it very shocking when they came here into the spirit life to learn that none of that was reflected in their environment, that mm. security, that, that comfort uh, that they had worked so hard to achieve. And many of them, upon arriving here, felt very listless because they were so used to 
gaining a sense of worth through activity and mm. there's no activity to do when you enter that state that we all entered into mm. there's not much in the environment there's no productive thing that can be done one is just sort of in this lost hazy place wandering and um a lot of them had a lot of anger come up before they were open to to hearing the truth about um about the fact that the way they had lived was actually sinful. Mm. Mm. So they they were wor- you know on earth they were obviously working quite hard and like mm. you said workaholics um, generally and and then when they pass um, because of the location and also the fact that there's no feelings kicking back anymore mm-hmm. is there of you know, of approval or acceptance of of that kind of attitude. Yes. And then there's nothing to work for. Yes. <laughs> and so there's a very large confrontation then, isn't there, of yes. a lot of different emotions all at the same time. Yes. Uh, which, which obviously then triggers mostly anger in the people involved, yeah. Yes, and it's quite interesting uh, when one enters this life properly. Um, you asked earlier about being earthbound. Many of the men express this um, experience where when they first passed they did spend some time again similar to myself engaged in the family and in their Mm. businesses and these men were not unfeeling about their family and it wasn't that they um, never saw their family it's just that their focus was very much on fulfilling a role for their family and they did do a lot of work um, in order to fulfill that role but so when they passed, many of them were still quite engaged with the family and their businesses. Many of them had built businesses and yes. they had wanted their sons to take over and sometimes that happened and, and sometimes, sometimes not. it didn't. And sometimes and sons failed. <laughs> yes, and so there's, there's a lot of pent-up emotion there. Yeah. But then once that hold upon the earth life is gradually released and uh, the men realised there's, there's somewhere else I need to go. It was like a growing sense there's somewhere else. And so they entered the, the life and found themselves in this, after the initial arrival, found themselves in this area. Many of them then really wanted to go back to the earth environment because at least there they had some... Uh, engagement <laughs> yes and with... some feelings coming back at them that, yes. that it was a good thing that they did. yes but it's curious the way that it was so hard for them then to actually come back yeah. after they'd properly entered the spirit life they found it very frustrating that they really couldn't maintain the energy um to to sort of be on earth as as engaged as they were, they kept feeling pulled back to this place mm-hmm. where we were, we were all entered until they found they just were there all the time. So I'm still learning about how that happens. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I what, see now the benefit that, that course, we must yeah. stay where we are, but yeah, yeah, they found course. it frustrating. Yes, and, and most people try for an initial period, don't they, to skip, skip out of the, what the environment is informing you about, yes. isn't it? And go back to an environment that's not really informing you very much at all, aside from the fact if you notice your addictions, <laughs> yes, then you might be informed. But yes. most people on there on earth, of course, are not uh, noticing their addictions. They're just living in them instead. Yes, and mm. when we enter a state like that, we have been purposefully, uh, we haven't learned those lessons. And the environment itself, I've come to understand, is there to help us learn the, mm. those things that we were fighting learning on the earth. I mentioned earlier my son's passing and I see now that that was a huge upheaval in my life that was really a lot of my grief could have helped me to identify where I had been going wrong in terms of my family life. And the level of investment you had in your children in order to live what you perceived was a happy life. Yes, yeah. um, because much of that emotion was stirred up. And then because I didn't deal with that properly, I now understand that that was the commencement of my cancer process also, yes. um, yeah. which ultimately caused me to pass. And now I've had the good fortune to learn here. So where is your son who passed before you? Uh, he's, well, 
<sighs> he's on a, a different path to myself. Yes. He, from what I understand, and we have, we've met a few times now, but he's between the second and fourth spheres quite a lot. Yes. So he's not really interested in developing with God or... Not as yet, uh, I'm hopeful, yeah, but uh, yeah. not invested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, he, spent, um, he spent about 10 years here, uh, perhaps a little less before... My math is not that good, but because of the time I spent on the earth after I passed... Past. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but he spent some time here before I came to see him. He is more intellectually driven, um, but he's very happy, yeah. and that's that was wonderful to see. And I did have when he passed, I had some concerns about. While I didn't think very much about really the reality, I I was hoping he was somewhere where he was loved. And yeah. uh, it yeah. was wonderful to see that that was true. And none of your other children have passed yet? No. No. Your husband's obviously passed. Yes, yes. And where is he? Though now? fairly recently. Yeah. He's, he is in the first sphere still. Yeah. And yeah. so I, it's been an honour to assist him a little. Yeah. Yeah. How is it with, uh, with the others who are there in your group? Uh, have a lot of their relatives since passed? Um, it varies. It varies, um, but I wouldn't say not their direct family, like their children. Uh, many many spouses have passed, yeah. um, but we we we're, we're very similar group. It's a strange thing. Uh, again, a lot of us have just come together for this discussion. Of course, so uh, yeah. some of us we're just getting to know each other. Yes, it's it's. <laughs> It's quite wonderful, really, to get to know each other, to realise we're all at a very similar point. And, and it's also, isn't it interesting how when all of you come together at once, you've got sort of the male view of his life and what happened. Yes. And then you can see the, the female view of her life and what happened. And you can see that many of you shared the same kind of life, but in a different role. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And it's, 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 it's great to reflect on all yeah. those things. Yeah. And most people on earth wouldn't believe that embracing a role could cause a lot of sin. No. But the reality is that in, in embracing a role, we do a lot of things, don't we, that sacrifices love of self, mm. love of others, and also love of uh, true morality and, and truth. You know, we sacrifice a lot of truth usually when we embrace a role. Yes, and, yes. And I'm, I feel I'm coming to learn about that morality and the the importance of truth just now just yeah. now it's yeah. it's taken me um until this point and all of us until this point to really um properly come to release a lot of what we thought was good and loving within those roles that we took on and i i suppose i feel very passionate about just helping people to question the people who are on earth now, helping them to question what roles they're automatically filling without thinking about it. And how... Does that make sense? Certainly, like you say, the lack of introspection about their life. Often people are so busy with their life not realising that most of the business is being caused by these quite severe addictions that they are not seeing as addictions at mm -hmm. all, but rather seeing as a, what makes you a good woman or what makes you a good man or what mm. makes you a good father or a good mother and so forth. So much is done on automatic. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, that is a huge... And you, you can see the, God's, uh, God's desire is for us to all develop desire. And, and what those particular things do is usually suppress desire and also make our lives very constrained, doesn't, doesn't yes. it? So your life on earth and, and also the men who passed, uh, who you've described, it, both, both genders felt very constrained after you passed because of this lack of interest in anything other than a few basic things to do with family. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's very true. And working for family and doing things for family and taking on a role for the family, whatever that role is, whether it's a mother or a father whether it's the provider or the or the caregiver yes type of roles yeah. yes and 
I suppose that is the broader purpose of coming here. As I jokingly said at the beginning, I felt almost stereotypical. (laughs) (laughs) And perhaps some of these roles and definitions we've spoken about are now viewed as stereotypes on earth. But there are two things to say about that. One is that I see, as I mentioned earlier, while the lifestyle externally may appear to have changed, many times the, the same injuries that drove my concept of what was a good woman and Roger's concept of what was a good man still exist of within course. individuals. And but, they will continue to do so until people release it emotionally. Exactly, obviously. Mm. exactly. And even if we fight with our intellect against that, if we've inherited it and it hasn't been released, we will act in it. Yes. And, and then secondly, these, these examples, our lives are examples of quite um, pronounced and simple uh, areas where we've f- fulfilled a role. They're simple to understand, I suppose. They're not simple to live, no, <laughs> but no. simple for people to grasp. But there are many ways that we take on many different roles. And if our examples could help people just to view, um, to question what do I believe is a good person and how much of that is based upon actual reasoning about love and morality and how much of that is just things that I automatically do and I actually feel quite sad or resentful inside about them. Yes. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, how you can feel resentful inside about something and yet still have a huge motivation to do it. Yes. Um, and I feel this is something not many people on earth really question very much mm-hmm. in the sense that, that they don't see that there's this feeling of dissatisfaction that exists inside of them. Surely there needs to be some more self-reflection on the matter as to why you feel so driven to do it still when inside of you you don't really want to be doing it but you're feeling like you sort of have to do it, like it's a duty, like you said, or like society will not accept you doing anything different, or your family in particular won't accept you doing anything different. And then there's also that aspect, isn't there, of the suppression of desire in the process. And it feels to me that a lot of people on earth um, spent their, their li- they've made their lives, particularly parents, have made their lives so busy, in particular being what they believe is a good parent, without considering how it's affecting not only their own uh, lives in terms of their own happiness and their own joy, and, but also how it's infecting the children with attitudes and uh, demands that are actually going to be very, very damaging for them at some point in the future. Because what I, Mary and I, you might have heard us comment in the past, but we've often commented about how we see young, young children nowadays being they they have such a huge level of demand that everything is put on tap. Everything is available to them. You know, what their friends have, they must have and so forth. This, these demands are so excessive now that if you take even away from quite small children now, any one of these particular things, there is a huge rage that the child expresses as a result of it being taken away, which indicates the strong demand, the strong sinful demand that now exists in the child even because of the way in which the children has, have been brought up and, and brought to expect that they can demand these things from their family and society. Yes, mm. it's interesting. So we see actually there's this whole, there's this huge amount of potential rage in, in younger, the younger generations that are on the planet and their rage is yet to be fully expressed. And once things are taken away from them, that's when you'll see the, potent, you know, the, the level of demand and level of unloving desires that exist in them that have all been created through the expectations or the way in which they've been parented in most mm. cases. Yeah. Yes, I'm interested to see this because certainly mm. the idea of self-sacrifice is changing in this younger generation. But I'm interested to see how they will grow into adults if they will come around to, to taking on the role that their parents have taken on with them or if 
the sense of entitlement will be so strong that they will actually feel entitled to things from their children. Yes, I, I, think, I think the second one is more highly likely. Um, the way you see them developing now as children, by the time they're just, you know, in their early teenage years, they are now so demanding and so angry whenever they don't get their comforts met, that to actually have a child and require, you know, as you know, a child bringing up a child does require a level of uh, care for the child mm -hmm. that, that involves at times, uh, you know, like you'd like to sleep, but you have to get up and feed the child, those yes. kind of things. And a lot of these uh, children nowadays would not even consider doing that um, for many of them. Mm -hmm. They would prefer not to do that. And so many are actually choosing not to have children as yes. a result uh, of yes, these particular issues mm -hmm. and that way they can avoid the discomfort of it all and so you can see a lot of uh, quite bad uh, situations developing as a result of the self-sacrificing generation if we mm -hmm. could say as well mm -hmm. that that are influencing uh, children in, as adults now to do different things too so this is why we need to see it as sin because it does re it, it, like create not only a lot of problems for ourselves when we pass, mm -hmm. but also for our children and the following generations of children. Yes. Uh, we don't see, you know, we need to see the long-term effects, don't we, of what it creates, yeah. Yes, mm. yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and perhaps I'm just being reminded here by our leaders um, who have brought us here, just to remind also people that... Um, the idea of what makes a good woman and what makes a good man, while that may have varied since my time on earth, there are still very strong ideas about that. Uh, and if, regardless of the sense, I suppose my example about sacrifice uh, was just that, an example. An example, yeah. Yeah, so even if a person has a sense of entitlement, they also have ideas about what makes a good woman and exactly. what makes a good man. And so often just, towards the other man. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sort yes. of like So when you grow up with a sense of entitlement as a man, you then have a higher sense of demand of what makes a good woman yes. generally. And, That's right. and vice versa. If you're brought up with entitlement as a woman, you have a really high demands upon the man in this, that, that are obviously going to be quite da damaging to yourself and to him if, yes. if, it's, a, if it's followed through. With, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so the, these, uh, this self-reflection is a requirement, isn't it? This, this, yes, mm. and I think now about how little self... I filled my life, as you said earlier, with all of the things that I felt I needed to do to be a good wife and mother and mm. woman, and I spent no time in self-reflection. Yeah, yeah. And so um, this is something we're hoping the next group will encourage, you know, some self-reflection about action and how the actions demonstrate how the motivation, you know, the, the belief systems, the values, the morality and the faith need to be sorted out, mm -hmm. you know, preferably here on earth. Because as, as your experience illustrates, uh, the first part of passing when you're in this sort of no man's land is very uncomfortable, isn't it? And, yes. and, it, and it can last a long time. For, for many of you, how long did that period last? Well, it varies. And... And I should say some people have been here much longer than myself. Yes. I didn't mention that earlier. Some passed at, at the turn of the last century with very similar injuries to my own. Um, for myself, it was a period of about five years. Um, it varies. Some people uh, became fed up <laughs> within Sooner. a year, yes. <laughs> yeah. And ironically, some of the men who, who felt much angrier than some of the women uh, were able to kind of break out of this existence and receive some assistance. Because they expressed their anger yes. and let some go. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Whereas for, for, for me, there was a lot of beliefs about a good woman not being angry, angry as well, yes. <laughs> which uh, yeah. slowed my progression and yeah. slowed my... Um, it was really, I put up a lot of barriers to um, confronting my concept of a good woman and being able to be told that, that there was a lot of sin in what I believed was loving. Yeah. yeah. And so it varied. Other people, 10 years, but um, I think that's, it, that's more of an extreme yeah. example. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, thank you very much for coming and talking about of this. Of course, subject. I should say we didn't just move from there to where we are now. Of course, of course. I, I, th- I think we... <laughs> I hope your viewers understand. I'm sure yes. if they've watched a lot of other videos, I think <laughs> yeah. that might be quite plain. Yes, good, good, because <laughs> there was a lot of learning. But yes. just leaving that very initial uh, place. Yes. So obviously, um, in your case, it's taken from 1983 to now to arrive into the third sphere yes. of the spirit world. Yes. So obviously people can see that the very first portion you spent a few years sort of or a year or so earthbound, you could yes. say, and then the next five years or so you spent sort of just trying to figure out where you were and what was going on and why. Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, you got yourself into a state where you wanted to know and that's yeah. when you could be helped. And from the time that you could be helped, we're now really talking another, like, 20, 20 38, uh, 20, is it 38 years or so? Uh, my, my 28 years or so, isn't yeah, it? 28. Yeah, so, so you know, that's a, that's a long time for somebody. So to, there's a lot of lessons in that, obviously, yes, to a learn. Lot, a lot of lessons. That you've had to learn in that process. Yes, I call my initial place, like, the nowhere place or the <laughs> waiting place because it was really like that, waiting yeah. for me to grow the desire to know more. Yes, it's interesting too how when we live a role, we don't really want to know about the role and what or or change the role, isn't it? That that's also a part of the problem. That's right, mm. and to know much more of anything really, because the role dictates what I should want and what I should do and yes. what I should be interested in. Yes, and then getting out of that, uh, having some desire yes. to get out of that, means having a desire to actually look at is this role thing that I've got going on really is, has it caused me trouble now yes. rather than just being a good thing, you mm. know, as I thought in the past. Mm. So for many of you, you've taken a, uh, some time now to, so for those of have passed the turn of the century last, uh, I mean, mean the turn of the 18th to 19th, uh, was it yeah. 19th to 20th, sorry, 19th century. 19th to 20th, <laughs> yeah, sorry. yeah. Obviously, it's taken some time to learn those lessons. Yes. And obviously it'd be lovely, isn't it, that if people on earth didn't have to go through that experience of taking a 100 years to learn some of those basic lessons about what constitutes a sin in the family role situation. <laughs> yes, and that is why we come, to yeah. try and help people to, to become aware while still on earth. Yes. Obviously there's potential to change things on earth markedly, but when people have defined roles, there's also quite a lot of anger directed at you when you try when you're the first person trying to give up the role so in a family relationship if the wife starts trying to give up the role then often the husband and the children are just enraged with her Mm -hmm. uh, while she's trying to do that and they're not very supportive at all Uh, whereas at least in the spirit world the environment does support your your growth in that regard doesn't it yeah Yeah. it doesn't support the sin which is wonderful that's right Yeah. yeah whereas here on earth the environment frequently supports the sin and when you try to give up the sin then they think you're sinning (laughs) everyone else thinks you're sinning and i've been through that myself and so have many who've tried to give up you know to work through their issues with their partners or their children often they receive a lot of anger from their children or their partners as a result of that yeah Mm. Well, thank you for your time marjorie and and thank you for the group uh, visit visiting us Uh, that's very nice Hopefully uh, there's some progress. Obviously there's intergender emotional issues that must be faced coming up. Yes, yes, yes um, obviously. Because uh, that is what's going to help you move from the third to the fifth at least, isn't it? Okay. And yeah. and all of us coming together, it's, it's quite lovely uh, yeah. to have both genders. So exactly. perhaps that is part of our... Our learning. It's a large group, 50,000 of us gathered here today. Yeah, so it gives you the chance, doesn't it, to talk with each other a bit about the the gender based issues that you may face about you know what you expect of a man or what the men expect of their women and so yes. forth and how those expectations have been acted out on earth and also how they can be now worked through in the spirit world mm. yeah and have many do many of you know who your soulmates are at this stage no no, no. no. that is all ahead of us <clears throat> we're told yeah yeah, and my feelings are until those, uh, you know, intergender emotional issues are worked through, it's going to be difficult to recognise your soulmates, isn't mm-hmm. it? Because you, those role-based systems often cause a clouding of your, of your attractions as a result. 
The other thing I feel that will help you both as or all as a group is to really start now connecting with those desires fully, isn't it? The yes. personal discovery, the discovery of your own passions and desires. I feel on the brink of that. Yeah. 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 I feel very fortunate to be where I am at this time, yeah. actually. Because you've gotten rid of now a lot of the uh, chains uh, and, and that were holding you back from discovering yourself. Yes, yeah. and I've come a ways to be humble to know that I have a lot to learn and feel joyful about that. Yeah. It was difficult initially to to recognise that I had so much wrong, so much wrong about what I perceived and to now feel quite joyful about not only the potential of uh, discovering new things and exploring my interests but also just the potential of learning more about what existence is really about. Yeah. I feel excited yeah. for that. And obviously developing a relationship with God is going to help with that and also having that connection with through the conscience where God can tell you yes. things straight away rather than having to go through a lot of discovery is obviously going to be beneficial there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, we look forward to seeing what happens for the next few years then uh, I would say it's going to be a little you know usually when you've gone through a time to get to the third sphere like that usually after a while the passion starts developing and then <laughs> <laughs> things start moving forward hey. yeah 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 it's a, it's a good time yeah yeah <laughs> thank you so much for having us yeah it's our pleasure yeah thanks for coming and thanks for sharing your experience about what you've discovered seemed to be that you didn't think it was on earth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah.